I'm particularly fond of this pairing because um, Paul Brennan is very much a gen genomics ex expert and, also, and is exploring uh, genomic signatures relative to environmental contaminants. And um, Dr. Code Jevenis is a big picture kind of start with the environment first and see what that influence is on the genes kind of research perspective. So I'm going to give the floor to each of them a, a bit of five minutes. Maybe you could describe your research and then pass over to Dr. Manolis and then maybe we could have a bit of um, a discussion about how the, the two of these marry up to a very effective way to lead us forward in filling in the gaps of knowledge that we have because we don't wholeheartedly understand how much these low-level toxicants in our environment influence our, you know, our, our contracting cancer or not contracting cancer. And uh, that's just one of many gaps in our knowledge, but this is the one we'll explore during this session. So with that, I'll leave it to you. Thanks. Mm. Thanks, Barbara. So well, I'll, I'll finish, well, I'll start with a, a kind of a personal note because I joined the International Agency for Research on Cancer about 20 years ago, wow. and I joined to work in the environmental group at that time, and in fact, Manolis was the person who left, and because Manolis left, I, I had the opportunity to come here, so mm. I've thanked him already a few times, because I, but I did come to work on environmental causes of cancer, and I was working in that group for about 10 years, and then I took over the genetics section in the agency, and the reason why I wanted to work in genetics was the same reason I wanted to work in the environmental group, because I want to use genetics for prevention. It's not to find out targets for treatment or anything like this. It was to uh, use genetics and genomics to identify causes of cancer and also to identify how we can detect cancer early. And, and I guess one of the reasons, I mean, I think, I, I think Beatrice and Catherine talked wonderfully about how we need to implement what we know. Um, and I, I think Catherine shared a very nice slide there of the French situation of, of the major risk factors that we know. Although what we haven't really explored here is that there is still so much we don't know. Within, there was a wonderful evaluation in the UK recently, there's an evaluation in France, I think it's typical of most European countries, still about half of the cancer cases, the excess cancer cases that occur in a high income country like most countries in Europe, we have no idea what the cause is. For some cancers, we have no idea what's causing them. One of the most common cancers is prostate cancer. We have no idea why it might be, why it, it will vary, say, 50 folds between parts from, it's not screen, but you know, between parts of Europe and say parts of Asia. We cannot explain this. There are cancers that are increasing, like lymphomas, like testicular cancer. We have no idea what this is. So obviously, to prevent cancer, we need to know what causes it. And so one of the, you know, the, the aims of, of the program and of the work that I do with many other colleagues is to see how we can use genomics to identify new causes and also to detect cancers early. And I think, you know, we do need to have that discussion because, you know, as a community, and I think, you know, the, the people involved in cancer prevention, it's a wonderful community, very, very dedicated people. But, you know, I think our traditional tools have kind of, they, they, they've, they've, they're starting to come a little bit short. I don't know if you're going to agree or disagree with that, Minotis, but, you know, I I've, I've sometimes find the pace of our success very frustrating in that, you know, we are identifying perhaps more closely the role of obesity and physical activity and so on, but there's still a whole other story out there that we just are missing and we don't know what it is. And so genomics, the whole genomics revolution, if you want to call it, it is providing us new opportunities to identify specific causes. Now, I'll, I'll give you one, one or two examples. One example is that we've discovered in the last couple of years by sequencing tumors that when you look at the DNA changes that have occurred within the tumor, they leave the imprint of the exposure. So if you look at tumors that are, that are caused by tobacco, there are very specific changes in the DNA that are caused by specific compounds in tobacco. So it's very simple now to identify which cancers are caused by tobacco. Same with UV light. Completely other range of, 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 uh, of changes that occur. And these are called molecular signatures. That they're called tumors tumor signatures for, 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 for those tumors. And one of the, the possibilities is that we need to identify what signature is linked with what exposure and try to, to see whether we can then link these exposures to, to specific cancers. One example 
that we managed to produce for, for, from our own group that shows that this can work is that we helped lead a, a very large international sequencing project for renal cancers. It was funded, in fact, by, 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 by the FP7 uh, um, pr 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 program. And um, a lot of the cases came from Central Europe. And when we looked in the tumors of these, I mean, the, the goal here was really to identify markers for treatment. But when we looked in, in, in the tumors, we found that for a, a subgroup, and predominantly for those cases that came from Romania, there was a signature that had been reported elsewhere in the world in Asia associated with aristolochic acid consumption, which in Asia is used in herbal remedies, which in, in the Balkan region is a contaminant that generally gets mixed in with wheat and gets into the food chain, etc. So this is one area, and that, that was completely by chance, but it shows that if you look in the tumors, you can pick up signatures that will pinpoint particular exposures. And I think that is the sort of new type of study that we need to see how we can do this. You know, and it's not one group that can do this, because you need to have cases from all over the world. You need to have biologists who are able to link up exposures with specific mutation patterns, etc. But I think that that's the type of opportunity that, that, that we can try and, and use to, 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 to try and understand what is happening for the, the half of those cancers that, 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 we, that we can't explain. Just how many samples did you need to kind of make that link? I'm, I'm wondering, it was, was it kind of a massive sequencing that link, effort, well, the, or was it, you know? That, that link was quite curious yeah. because, in fact, it, we, we had 14 cases from Romania. It was a very mm -hmm. small population from, from, from Romania. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just that we happen to have very good links in Bucharest with hospitals in Bucharest that we managed to recruit those cases. Um, so, but I would envisage that for other studies, if you want to try and identify mutation signatures that might be, that might be a lot more subtle. I mean, we, we've identified the obvious ones like tobacco and UV light and so on. But I imagine that many other carcinogens, they might leave uh, mutation signatures that are a lot more subtle in which case the numbers needed will be far larger. Um, so so that, in that case, the signature was so strong, it was obvious. Do you need a, a hint at what the carcinogen may need to, is before you find the signature? Do you, you know? No, or, well, yeah. there, are, there are toxicology programs that are underway in different parts of the world now that are trying to do either in yeast or in mouse models, or whatever, blasting these different forms of DNA with carcinogens to try to identify what the signatures are that they leave. So that, that is a whole area of work that is just opening up now. Mm -hmm. But at some point, what we will need is the large populations from different parts of Europe, different parts of the world, with those tumors collected in really the right way to be able to undertake this, this, this sort of study. But it's something that has to be done really on an international level. It's not something that can be done by one group. And it's, you know, again, thinking of you know, how we are going to really try and uncover this you know, missing 50%. You know, I think more and more, it's, you know, we have to work together. We have to use mm -hmm. the, 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 these different ideas. I mean, it is, again, this sort of project that you know, FP7, Horizon 2020, have been excellent at initiating. But you know, it's, that's a small, relatively modest part of the overall cancer research budget uh, mm -hmm. you know, when, you, when you look at Europe as a whole. Mm -hmm. Thank you.